Everybody in this room duly acknowledged. On behalf of the Governing Council of the University of Cape Coast, management, staff and students, and the entire university community, I wish to welcome all of you to the 11th Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lecture Series of the University of Cape Coast. The Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lecture Series was instituted by this university in 1974 and dedicated to the memory of the late first president of the Republic of Ghana, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, for his vision in establishing this university and also for spearheading the course of Pan-Africanism in particular and the progress of the black world in general. Kwame Nkrumah's view on education was that it should serve as a catalyst for development. And to him, for Ghana to achieve her desired objective and potential education should be of critical importance. The University of Cape Coast was therefore founded to play a key role in the effort of national development through education. And it was not unusual in the early days of her establishment to find many of African descent come to the university to share in the knowledge and intellectual activity. By these lecture series, ladies and gentlemen, therefore, we wish to re-echo the dreams of the founding fathers and to remind ourselves of the set, uh, centrality of our role in Ghana and Africa's development. The second reason is to bring to bear the quality of education this university has been offering since its inception as a university college in 1962. A forum such as this reveals the highest possible level of scholarship that a university can be capable of. At these lecture series, the university calls on people of diverse academic and professional persuasions, both from within and outside the country, to think with it in an extended fashion about a relevant theme under the guidance of a carefully selected personality of demonstrable achievement and ability. This allows us to identify and fully appraise a contingent and contemporary theme for all our benefit. The last justification of these lectures is based on the Pan-Africanist Pan -Africanist agenda that Kwame Nkrumah advocated for, for throughout his political career as I have mentioned earlier. Nkrumah's vision of Pan-Africanism seeks to define a common ground for all Africans, wherever they may be. The lecture series is therefore our way of paying tribute to this man, his vision, his nationalism, his distinctive service to Africa globalism a globalism based on freedom and justice. Since the university instituted a lecture series, distinguished personalities from Ghana and from outside Ghana 
have been invited to deliver thought-provoking lectures on different themes. Today, we are privileged to have Professor Patrick Lodge Otienu Lumumba. I hope I've pronounced the names well. I've forgotten the Kiswahili that I was taught some years in Kenya. Asante Sana. A distinguished academic, an astute lawyer, a constitutional expert, and a prolific writer to give us the 11th lecture on the theme, Africa Must Rise. The sub-themes of the lecture series are political reawakening, economic reorganization, uh, reorientation, sorry, and social cohesion, a call for African unity. Sir Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, without jumping the gun, I wish to welcome you once again to the University of Competitive Choice and to the first in the series of the 11th Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lectures to be delivered by our distinguished personality, Professor and let me abbreviate PLO Lumumba, not, not to be confused with an organization. <laughs> Distinguished Professor Karibu Akwaba, you're most welcome. Bienvenue. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Chairman and members of the University Governance Council, the Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, faculty members, staff and students, Nananum in particular, Osabarama Kusiata, all, to the 11th in the series of the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lectures. A very, very special welcome, of course, goes to our distinguished speaker, affectionately known to a number of people in Africa as PLO, Professor Lumumba because accompanied by a delightful wife, Celestine, and a beautiful daughter, Jane. You are welcome. As you all know, these lectures, which, as the Vice Chancellor said, were inaugurated in 1976, are dedicated to the memory of our first president, Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Osajifu devoted his entire political life to the course of Ghana in particular, and in Africa in general. Indeed, it has been said that for Osajifo, Ghana was his constituency and Africa his country. And he strongly believed, as you all know, that it, was, it is only through unity that Africa can confront the myriad of challenges that we face. Osajifo's ideas, his ideals and accomplishments are very much with us today. And without any doubt at all, his legacy continues to live on in the hearts of millions of Africans. We at UCC proudly count this university as one of his finest achievements. And it is therefore with pride that we host these annual lectures. We seek to address the social, economic, and political development of Africa in particular, and the black world in general, a cause that was very dear to the heart of Osajifo. Let me say that since its inception, the series has been hugely successful. Our speaker after speaker has treated us to well-researched, incisive, and thought-provoking views on the challenges that we face as a continent and as a people. There has never been a dull moment. Today, we'll continue in the same tradition. Today's speaker, as I said earlier, is Professor Patrick Locke Otieno Lumumba. Professor Lumumba has had a very distinguished career in law and, of course, in public service. Prof is currently the director and chief executive of the Kenya School of Law. He's a professor of public law and founding dean of the Kabarak University 
School of Law. He has lectured at the University of Nairobi, the United States International University, Widener University USA, Nairobi Samak School. He is an advocate of the high courts of Kenya and Tanzania. He holds bachelor's of law degrees and master's of law degrees from the University of Nairobi and an LLD from the University of Ghent in Belgium. He is a certified public secretary and a member of Kenya's Institute of Management. He has been trained on human rights at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London, humanitarian law at the Ruhr Wallenberg University Institute of the University of Lund in Sweden, and on international humanitarian law in Geneva, Switzerland. He is a renowned public, uh, legal practitioner. He's written several books, including Criminal Procedure in Kenya, An Outline of Judicial Review in Kenya, Kenya's Law Search for a Constitution, The Postponed Promise, and Judicial Review and Administrative Law. He's published numerous articles in referred journals and several book chapters. Indeed, he has co-authored The Constitution of Kenya 2010, an introductory commentary with Dr. Louis Franceschi. He has also co-authored several books on ethics. His non-legal books include Swearing by Kenya, a call for political hygiene in Kenyan politics and from raw deal to real deal. He has also co-authored 27 other books on integrity as school series. He is a former secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission and a former director of the Defunct Anti-Corruption Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, he is a founding trustee of the African Institute for Leaders and Leadership and the founding chairman of the Association of Citizens Against Corruption. Prof has been named and recognized by the International Com Commission of Juries and the Law Society of Kenya for his exemplary contribution to the legal profession. He has, was recognized by the Kenyan U.S. Association for Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Award in 1996 and was the recipient of the 2008 Martin Luther King Africa Salute to Greatness Award by Martin Luther King Jr.'s Africa Foundation. He's also been included in the Marquis Who is Who in the World and is a distinguished Julius Nyerere lecturer for 2014. As you can tell, Professor Lumumba has earned a huge reputation throughout the continent and beyond, indeed for his oratory. He's a much sought after speaker and his speeches are known for their passion, candor, authenticity, freshness, depth, and humor. His oratory indeed reminds one so much of Osajefo, who in his speeches very much exhibited all the attributes that you see on display over the next three days. Let me assure you that if you came here today hoping to be provoked, you will live here provoked. If you came here hoping to be challenged, you're going to be challenged. And lastly, if you came, sorry, if you came here hoping to be informed, you will live here suitably informed. And lastly, if you came here to be stimulated, you will not be disappointed. But before I invite Professor Lumumba, I'd like to tease you with one of his most famous quotations. And I quote, the tragedy of Africa is that Africans are in the business of canonizing thieves and demonizing the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure not too many of us would disagree with that assertion. So on that very provocative note, with the greatest pleasure, let me invite Professor Lumumba to give today's lecture. My very good friend, Sir Sam Jonah, the Vice Chancellor of the University, the Registrars, the Academics, Nana, the students here present, good afternoon. 
Let me say that I am very happy to be with you this afternoon on the occasion of the 11th lectures to remember the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma. It is fitting that these lectures are to be held here at an institution that was the brainchild of Kwame Nukuruma in his very early years as a patriot of this country and a lover of this continent. It is fitting that these lectures were instituted in his memory two years after his death. And it is fitting that this country now knows that Kwame Nukuruma was an asset not only for the country but for the continent. Several years ago, when Africans throughout the world were asked to name the greatest African who ever lived in the 20th century, the vote identified the Osage for Kwame Nukuruma as that person. Today, therefore, having been given the privilege of giving a lecture in his memory, I've decided to commence this series with the very area in which he excelled. You will remember in 1957, when Ghana attained her political independence, Kwame Nukuruma was as clear as he was passionate. The independence of Ghana was but a beginning of the independence of Africa. In those early days, the bulk of Africa was under colonial rule save for Ethiopia and Liberia. And it was very clear to him that Ghana's attainment of independence was, just a, was but a beginning of a process that would take great effort. On that day, he recognized that the very first task that Africans had to grapple with was to regain their independence. His words have often been rendered in much more memorable form, not in the words that he himself spoke, but it has been said of him that he said, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest shall be given unto you. And indeed, Ghana did seek and obtained the political kingdom. And when he stood in Accra, Ghana, he not only recognized that Ghanaians had been free, but he recognized that the project of liberating Africa was just beginning. He recognized then that going forward, it would not be an easy task. He recognized at that time that the Portuguese were alive and well in Africa, controlling Mozambique, Angola, and Cape Verde. And he was conscious that his compatriots were fighting to liberate their countries. He therefore reminded those who were present on that day in Accra that going forward, that battle had to be finished. He recognized that the French were alive and well. They were present in Senegal. They were present in Guinea. They were present in Mali, Mauritania, Togo, Niger, Gabon, and many other areas. And he recognized that the French had to be removed and that Africans had to regain their independence. 
He recognized that the British were present in many African countries. They had been present in Ghana. They were present in the Gambia, in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Rhodesia then, and that they had to be removed. He was also alive to the fact that South Africa and Southwest Africa, now Namibia, was under the yoke of apartheid South Africa. Even in those early days, Kwame Nkrumah was so clear that the process of regaining African independence was also an excess and a, pre a process of exercising the ghosts of disunity in Africa. And that is why in his mind, it was important that independence did not just mean the attainment of a new flag and a new national anthem. It meant much more. One year after Ghana attained independence on the 15th day of April, 1958, to be exact. There was a meeting of the then eight independent African countries at which he reminded those who were present that going forward, it was important that Africa recognized the need for total liberation of Africa. Even in those early days, Kwame Nkrumah was under no illusion. He was under no illusion that the imperialist project was alive and well. And he exhorted those who were present in that assembly in Casablanca, in Morocco, that if Africa was to preserve her newly acquired independence, Africa had to look at the world differently. You will remember jointly with me that those were the years of the Cold War. Those were the years when the world was divided between the East and the West. And that gave meaning to Kwame Nkrumah's exhortation of the leaders then. Thou shalt look neither east nor west, thou shalt look forward. He exhorted African leaders on that day. Once again, in those very early years, he was clear that our politics had to be a politics of total liberation. And it has never been lost on me that even in those early years, there was no shortage of effort on the part of Kwame Nkrumah to bring unity and political vision to Africa. You will remember, even when there were only very few countries, he was present in Conakry in Guinea. He was present with Ahmed Sekotoure then. He was in Mali with Modibo Keita. He was with Patrice Emery Lumumba in the Congo to forge a united Africa. But this was never going to be easy. And if, as if Kwame Nkrumah was a prophet of sorts, no sooner had African countries started attaining political independence then the intrigues of the erstwhile colonial masters started rearing their ugly heads. It started so very early in 1960 in your very neighborhood here in Togo. The same year that Togo regained her independence from her colonizers in France is the very same year that their leader, Silvanus Olympio, was removed from power. And if one went a little to the east, only 210 days after Congo had attained her independence, Patrice Emery Lumumba was not only removed from power, but was also assassinated. In other words, the sun was setting at noon. 
and Kwame Nkrumah's fears were coming true. And that is why he moved with jet-like speed to begin to tell African leaders of the day that something had to be done. Because you will remember in the 1960s, that was the period when most countries started attaining their political independence. In 1960s, we had the Nigerians regain their independence. The Senegalese regained their independence, as did the Côte d'Ivoireans. Central African Republic, Kenya, Uganda, and many other leaders and countries regained their independence. So that when the leaders met in the month of May, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1963, Kwame Nkrumah was already very clear that the only way in which Africans could immunize themselves from the shenanigans of the worst wild political masters was to unite. Those of you who are alive then, and those of you who have been made alive courtesy of history will, history will remember the words of Kwame Nkrumah in 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. What amazes me at that time was the clarity with which he saw the issues of the day. What amazes me was the passion with which he identified the problems and the exactness with which he identified the issues which have continued to bedevil Africa today. Many leaders spoke on that day before Kwame Nkrumah spoke. The first leader to speak was, of course, the host of the African leaders, Ethiopia's Hail Selassie. And as if all of them had read Kwame Nkrumah's mind, Hail Selassie was clear in telling the 32 African leaders who are present on that day, not in so many words, but in effect he told them, we Africans have to unite and have to forge our own political agenda in order to ensure that our peoples are not only united, but we have the kind of politics that will give us a pride of place amongst the committee of nations in the world. And Hale Silasi set the tone. 32 African leaders spoke, and each one of them was clear that the area which we had to focus on was in the arena of politics and the kind of politics that we had to engage in in order to ensure that the continent was a continent that was free indeed. I remember only a few of those speeches. I remember that even those who later became hyenas as they grew into leadership were so clear in those early days that their voices were at once Solomonic and angelic. I remember the words of the then leader of Central African Republic, David Dako. He said, we are assembled here today as Africans my little country called the Central African Republic, what would it be without unity? If the colonizers wanted to take it, they would take it away. And the only way in which we can ensure that it's not taken away is through having a political union in Africa. Even David Dako was clear in those early days. And as if there was a competition for clarity, Ahmadou Ahijo of Cameroon was equally clear. He said, and I quote, I'm happy to be present with you here today. We come here to identify what is our common interest. And I have no doubt in my mind that Africa will only grow if our politics is the kind of politics that will help improving the quality of the lives of our people. 
But that clarity was not only restricted to Central and West Africa. Even in East Africa, there was clarity of thought. And that clarity was to be found in the words of Tanzania's first prime minister and president, Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. And he said, we come here not to find ourselves. We come here to find a common denominator. And that common denominator is the unity of the African peoples on the basis of the kind of politics that will lead this continent into the right direction. That clarity was amazing. But the man who captured the moment was the Osajefo Kwame Nukuruma. There was a sense in which when I read and reread Kwame Nukuruma's speech, I am amazed at how far he could see. I am amazed at how clear he was in his vision. There is not a single sector of the African economy, of the African society, or African politics that he did not look at. But in the arena of politics, he was clear in 1963. What amazes me was the sense of urgency on that day. He told the leaders, we must not come out of this arena without unity. He told them that if we do not unite today, I can tell you that the imperialists are not resting. He told them, that today we must leave this hall in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with the United States of Africa. Because if we do not, Africa will not survive the intrigues of the erstwhile imperialists. He reminded the audience that the colonial project and the neo-colonial project was alive and well. He told them that there was a need for unity on that day. He reminded the 32 leaders who are present that they had not gone there for a jamboree, but they had gone there to create an Africa and a united Africa. And he told them, we must unite now because if we do not unite now, each one of us will get used to our sovereignty and the trappings of power. He told them all of that. As if Kwame Nukuruma had the foresight of a Jewish prophet, all those things have come to pass. Of course, the organization of African unity was the product of reluctant leaders who could not see what Kwame was seeing sitting even when they were standing on 10 feet poles. And there is a sense, therefore, in which one talks about African unity and political reawakening today is because we come from that very clear and rich history. And we ask ourselves what it is that happened, where, it, where is it that the rain started beating us? You know, you Ghanaians, in 1966, in your lack of wisdom collectively, <laughs> you chose to truncate Kwame Nukuruma's presidency. And this guilt you must bear because it's a historical guilt. And when he left, he was in Hanoi on his way to Hanoi in Vietnam. He was larger than life. The world, the black world respected him. He was seen as the leader of the black man wherever he was. 
but he had no shortage of enemies. Because men who do good have no shortage of enemies. The only person who of his contemporary leaders saw something good and unique in him was Guinea's Ahmed Seko Touré. And you will remember with me that when he came back, it was in Conakry in Guinea that he was to settle until he left for Romania. And in his wisdom, Ahmed Seko Touré made him the co-president. In fact, Ahmed Seko Touré wanted him to be the president. It is he who said, no, it cannot happen. And he became the co-president. Why is this history necessary? Because at that time, Ghana was able, the leaders of the day were able to demonize Kwame Nkuruma. His legacy was almost obliterated. The statues that had been erected in his honor were brought down. So true that a prophet has no honor in his own home. But in 1972, he was taken upstairs. And when he was, and when the Ghanaians and Africans started reading some of his works, they were able to realize that a great man had lived in their land. Kwame Nkrumah's memory was restored, and lo and behold, we celebrate a great Ghanaian, a great African. And the reason why we celebrate the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah is because something happened in Africa and something continues to happen in Africa which has not allowed Africa to realize our potential. Of course, the coup in Ghana was in 1966, but there had been an earlier coup, as I said, in Togo in 1960, and an even earlier confusion in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1961. But then thereafter, Africa started to move in a totally different direction. My own countryman, the renowned novelist Ngugi Wathiongo writes, in an article, The Politics of Self-Reliance, he says that it would appear that when Africans raised the new flag, the leaders of the day were mentally lynched. They had ears, but they could not hear. They had eyes, but they could not see. And there is a sense in which Ngugi was right. Because then, coup d'etats started taking place in Africa. In Nigeria, they took away Namdi Azikiwe and Abubakar Satafawa Balewa and the Sodana of Sokoto. And there is a sense in which Nigeria has never been the same again. There is a sense in which Nigeria has never been the same again. They did not stop there. They went to Algeria and they took away Ahmed Ben Bella. And there is a sense in which Algeria has never been the same again. They did not stop there. They came down to Mali and they took away Modibo Keita. And there is a sense in which Mali has never been the same again. They went to Mauritania and they took others and much more prominently they took away Mokta Oldada and Mauritania has never been the same again. They did not stop there. They were not in the business of stopping. <laughs> they went to Central African Republic. They took away 
David Dako, they went to Cameroon, they took away Hamadou Ahijo, they tried to take away Sekoture, they failed. But they did not stop there. They went into every country, they went to Congo, they went to Uganda, they went everywhere, and they took away leaders so that Africa was, in a manner of speaking, a pawn in the political chessboard of the erstwhile colonizers. In fact, coup d'etats became so frequent in Africa that those who did not love Africa were hard to say that coups were as frequent as breakfast in Africa. <laughs> what they did not know was that even breakfast was no longer frequent on African tables. Because <laughs> Africans were no longer engaged in agriculture. Africa was no longer engaged in any meaningful production. All these while the organization of African unity, which had been created in 1963 as our savior, was not doing much. African Union, organization of African unity, became an annual jamboree of dictators, at which they discussed very little. African politics had changed. When the coups left us, he did not stop there. The degeneration of African politics continued apace. Leaders who are surrogates of the colonizers dotted the African continent. And Africa became infamous for leaders whose greatest claim to fame was that they exploited their people and destroyed their countries. Who among you here will forget the exploits of Congo's Mobutu Sese Sek, who at one time was richer than his country, courtesy of his kleptocratic regime? Who among you here will forget the madness of Jean Bedel Bokas? who crowned himself an emperor, who among you here can afford the luxury of forgetting such individuals? Who among you will forget the activities of Mengistu Hail Mariam in Ethiopia? Who among you can afford that luxury? Who among you here can afford to forget the activities of Hussein Habre in church. And the list is as long as your arm. African leaders were engaged in the kind of politics that was destructive of the continent. And African peoples were no longer enjoying their independence. Nkrumah had been clear in his mind that we seek first the political kingdom and the rest will be given unto us. But it would appear that the African leaders had it differently. Seek ye first the political kingdom and poison the political kingdom they must have had. So they poisoned the political kingdom and denied the African population the opportunity of enjoying the economic dividends of independence. They denied the Africans the opportunity of enjoying the dividends of unity. And Africa became not only the land of coups, but also the land of guerrilla fighters. Because these guerrilla fighters now emerged from the bush because Africa had to be liberated one way or the other. We had many of them. In Ethiopia, we had a guerrilla movement that brought up Meles Zenawi. And to his credit, there was some semblance of normalcy and sobriety returned to Ethiopia. In Rwanda, after the genocide in 1994, we had Paul Kagame, and to his credit, there was some semblance of normalcy and sobriety returned to that country. There was the emergence of Yoweri Kaguta Museveni in Uganda, and to his credit, he restored some sobriety and normalcy to that country. 
we had another one in Liberia, but to his lack of credit, he destroyed that country, Charles Taylor. <laughs> so that what happened is that African politics was confused. And I want to submit to you that African politics was not only confused, but it had been captured by individuals who had no interest in the safety and long-term health of the continent. So there was a time, because there was never ever a shortage of African leaders who meant well. They meant well, but there was always the hand of the erstwhile colonizer whose agenda was to demonstrate that Africans could not lead themselves. But even in those dark moments, there were great African leaders whose clarity of mind and clarity of vision was always the saving grace. It is not that they did not make mistakes, they made many mistakes, but they were honest mistakes. Who can forget Tanzania's Julius Kambarage Nyerere at that time? Who can forget at that time Zambia's Kenneth David Kaunda? Who can forget them? Who can forget at that time Leopold Sedar Sengo of Senegal? Who can forget at that time Cote d'Ivoire's Felix Houphé-Boigny? Who can forget that there were leaders who may have been making mistakes, including the introduction of one-party state as a possible antidote to the African problem, but they meant well. But the body of Africa was cancerous. And no amount of political chemotherapy was going to cure this cancer. The cancer had spread too deep. And that is why the effort today, I have said that there is need for the reawakening of African politics. Because what is happening in Africa today? Perhaps if we took a mental survey of Africa, you will be able to agree with me that this particular argument is both timely and legitimate. Afford me a little luxury, if only to run across Africa, to identify for ourselves what is wrong with Africa today, and why our politics need to enjoy some newly introduced political hygiene. Look at Africa today. Look at Gabon. They have just been through an election. And they do not agree as to who has won and who has lost. In Africa, everybody wins the election. <laughs> look at Gabon. I want you to look at Zambia. They do not know who has lost and who has won. In Africa, nobody loses an election. The Zambians are not at ease. And you can go to many countries. You can go to Uganda in the recent past, Kenya in the recent past. We, as Africans, have a problem. You know, I was telling a friend of mine that Africa has a problem with counting votes. In other parts of the world, they can have voters in 50 million, in hundreds of millions, but in Africa, our voters never get past 10 million, but for some reason, when we are called upon to count our votes, we never can count the votes. <laughs> this is an African disease, the inability to count votes. And in my view and in my submission, that inability and that inadequacy of Africa to count the votes is one of the problems why Africa must reorient and must reawaken in our politics. It is not lost on me that you Ghanaians will be going to the polls sometimes in the month of December. I pray and hope that you will be able to count your votes. <laughs> Thank you.
But my fear is that this African disease is also present in Ghana. And there is every danger that you will be unable to count your votes. But I pray I'm wrong. So when you look at Africa today, and sometimes we don't talk about it as openly and as passionately and as painfully as we should speak about it. Because we do not know and appreciate that Africa remains, in the words of a Westerner who said that Africa remains a scar on the conscience of humanity. We may think that that is not politically correct, but it is the truth as I speak to you. Today, if we continue with our survey of Africa, we'll have occasion during the other lectures to talk about the economy and, and unity, but let us focus on the politics of it. Look at Mozambique today. Attained our independence from the Portuguese as I speak to you now. It is not to be found in the headlines of many African newspapers, but there is a contestation in Mozambique between Frelimo and Renamo. The country is not at ease, yet they held an election. As I speak to you today, the Zambians are not at ease. They may have sworn their president on Tuesday of last week, but the opposition are now taking the matter, as they say, to the United Nations. We are exporting our problems. Africa cannot solve our problems. If you look at Angola, they are in a state that the Portuguese describe as nom guerra, nom paz, no war, and no peace. It is deceptive calm. You look at Equatorial Guinea, their politics is the kind of politics that does not allow people to express themselves. And as if Equatorial Guinea was not enough, you go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, the richest resource country in the world, yet one of the poorest countries in the world. They cannot hold an election. They say they have no money. You go to Burundi, it is the same thing. You go to Eritrea, Eritrea is not at ease. You go to Somalia, it is not at ease. You go to Central African Republic, you go to Burkina Faso, they expelled their president a few months ago. You go to Niger, go to Mali, they are killing one another as recently as yesterday. Go to Mauritania. Go to Sierra Leone, they are not at ease. Go to the Gambia. There is a sense in which Africa needs to conduct her affairs differently. Johnson Salif of Liberia is right. Africa is not poor. Africa is merely poorly managed. And that is why we must ask ourselves, what is wrong with us? Writing in 1983, the famed Ghanaian writer Chinua Achebe writes of his own country, and he could well have been writing about Africa. He says, the trouble with Africa is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. And I dare add, there is also a problem of followership. Africans elect the leaders that they deserve. A South African writer called Greg Mills in a book called Why Africa is Poor and What They Can Do About It says that what amazes him that despite the talk of democratization in Africa, it would appear that Africans are in the habit of making wrong choices 10 out of 10 times. When they are given the vote to vote, they are in the habit of electing thieves. And once they have elected the thieves, they expect the thieves to behave like angels. He says he does not understand the African electorate. I too do not understand the African electorate. 
And that is why, therefore, going forward, we Africans must ask ourselves a very critical question in the political arena. Because if we don't get it right in politics, we'll not get right in economics. History has demonstrated times without number that until and unless you get your politics right, you will never get it right in your economics. I remember not so long ago, there was a country which you must remember with me, and the country is still there, although I refer to it in the past tense. There was a country called the Philippines. It was led by a man called Ferdinand Marcos, who had a wife called Imelda Marcos, who had many shoes. <laughs> he presided over that country like a colossus. The country could not breathe, but the people praised him nevertheless. Then he lost power, and there came a lady who was the president of that country called Corazan Aquino. And Corazan Aquino said this, that experience and history has taught me one thing, that the thing called democracy, which we say in remembrance of Abraham Lincoln is a government for the people and by the people, is a good thing. But when the people do not know what they want, the government they create is nothing but a confederacy of fools. <laughs> I want to submit to us that if Africa is to liberate herself from the kind of politics that has held Africa down, Africa must go back to the words of the Osage for Kwame Nkuruma. You know, when you look at Africa, it was almost 50 years ago, in fact, more than 50 years ago, 53 years to be exact, in 1963 when the OAU was founded. We thought that the OAU was the problem and we said we started moving in the direction that had been prescribed to us by Kwame Nkuruma. So that in the year 2002, we created another body called the African Union. The African Union was designed to be a little bit more inclusive, a little bit more thoroughgoing than the OAU. Several years after the African Union, Africa is no better. Occasionally, our former colonizers want to make us feel good. And they tell us things that we want to hear. So that every other year, we have things that are called indices of democracy. And in these indices of democracy, they are hard to say that Africa is now democratizing. That African countries now hold elections frequently says Kenya held an election, Uganda held an election, Tanzania held an election, Ghana since 1979 has been holding an election. Every country has been holding election. Elections are the new thing in town. And we are therefore satisfied that frequent periodic elections are the solution to African problems. Every other year, Africans are confronted with candidates, and these candidates have also mastered the art. Periodically, they present to you the agenda of governance, and they remind you of little things that they may have done. That happens in Ghana, it happens everywhere in Africa, but the African condition remains the way it was 53 years ago. In real terms, those of you who are here may be a little better than your cousins in rural Africa, but in real terms, you are no better. In real terms, there is a sense in which your cousins in rural Africa 
don't have to grapple with rents that are paid two years in advance in Accra in Cape Coast. They don't have to grapple with importing tea and other things from the United Kingdom. They don't have to ally themselves with the political class in order to realize their dreams. There is a sense in which they are immunized from that. Yet there is a sense in which we cannot run away from politics and its impact on the quality of our lives. And that is why we must ask ourselves going forward, what it is or what is it that we must do in order to be politically awake? And that brings me to what I consider to be the major African problem and is something that we are very uncomfortable about. You know, in our unguarded moments, we Africans, in our unguarded moments, we behave as if we are inferior to the white person. In our unguarded moments, in fact, even in our guarded moments, we sometimes do so. And that is why when we have problems which can be solved within the African continent, we are much more ready to seek assistance elsewhere. You know, Samora Moises Marshall of Mozambique was addressing his people in uh, Maputo. And he said that he is amazed by the African. And he said, at one time, I had some Africans bragging about their colonial masters. That those who were colonized by the British were heard saying, we are different and better than you because we were colonized by the British. <laughs> they are more civilized. And they are more intelligent. And they presided over an empire over which the sun does not set. Samora said. Then there were those who were colonized by the French said, we are better because the French are cultured. It is the place of fashion and learning, so we are better than you, the Portuguese, who are colonized by the most backward nation on our, on our, in Africa, in, in, in Europe. And he concludes by saying that there is no colonization that can be better than the other. Yet there is a sense in which particularly those of us who have had the Western kind of exposure and education, we are the problem in terms of our political orientation. We who have gone to school are the ones who are the greatest danger to Africa. I do not know what it is that we do at our institutions of learning. But there is something that happens in those institutions right from primary school that makes our default mode the mode of thinking that we are children of a lesser God. And that is why, therefore, even when we play our politics, we want to be approved by external powers. I do not know where Ghana is going to print her ballots for the next election, but I suspect they'll be printed in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Ghana is no different from other countries. Africans have lost faith in themselves. They cannot trust themselves. They will never print ballots in Ghana because we, for some reason, believe that we are thieves and that if we print them, we'll steal them. In Zambia recently, they printed their ballots. In Dubai, in Kenya, we printed our ballots. In the United Kingdom, all the former French colonies will have them printed in Paris. Then you wonder why our politics is controlled by external factors. 
When African politicians have been engaged in an election, the very first congratulatory word that they expect if they were colonized by the British, they are waiting very eagerly whether the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom will ring them. And once they receive that call, then they will know that we have been approved and we are now good to go. There is need for reawakening in the manner in which we do things. In fact, there is a sense in which if we do not go back to what Kwame said in 1963, the, the tragedy is that Kwame Nkrumah could see this in 1963. He could see it. And that is, that is why he was saying, let us unite now. Because it is only in unity. I remember in 1963 when he's talking about political unity, he's saying, I am urging all of, those, all of you who are present here today, let us come out of this hall with a united Africa, with one army, with a one command unit, with one common currency, because it is only then that we are going to immunize ourselves from the shenanigans of our colonizers. Of course, you ended up with your little sovereignties, and today your politics are the subject of manipulation by European powers. If you had accepted Kwame Nkrumah's view, he was clear at that time that you would have one passport. Today, I moved three hours to Togo. I have a Togolese passport printed in France, <laughs> written in French, asking you about immigration and yellow fever certificate, <laughs> and asking you to look at a gadget in your eyes whether you have a, a Ebola. And yet the pastoralists across the border never looked at those things and never required any passport. Nkrumah could see this, and all this is courtesy of bad politics. You go between Senegal and Gambia, they are quarreling about the borders and, and the boundaries. And if you, when you cross the lead, the, 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 the nation, there are different ethnic, the same ethnic groups across the border. Africa must in the nature of things, ask herself, what must we do with our politics? This is the mother question. And why is this question important? It is important because I can tell you without being a Jewish prophet nor being related to one, that if we do not do anything about our politics, Africa will go nowhere. Today, there are two types of people who look at Africa. They are the Afro-pessimists and Afro-optimists. The Afro-pessimists take the view that Africa is God-forsaken, that Africa will go nowhere, that Africans will perpetually be hewers of wood and drawers of water for other civilizations, that Africa will only be humored by other civilizations. Those are the Afro-pessimists. Then there are those who take the view that Africa is now on the rise, that Africa can realize our potential, that Africa with our 1.1 billion people is capable in the next 50 years of competing with other civilizations. I am myself an Afro-optimist of the guarded kind. I believe that this continent has the capacity to shock the world. I have the conviction that this continent has the capacity to change Africa and to change the world. Has it ever been lost on you? that Africa has always been on the rise. Through different historical epochs, Africa has always been on the rise. 
In the 15th century, when the Portuguese were building the Elmina Council, Africa was on the rise. But it was on the rise for the Portuguese. Then it rose for the Dutch at the same castle. Then it rose for the English. Then it appeared to rise for the Ghanaians in 1957. It appeared to rise. <laughs> then something held her down and Ghana could never quite soar. And there was an apparent darkness at noon, but I now know it was never a sunset. I knew it was an eclipse. <laughs> and because it is an, ex an eclipse and there's only the clouds that have kind of shielded it, I know the African sun will rise in her splendor. <laughs> but it will only rise if we begin to do things differently. Today, there are few African countries that give me confidence that if we identify the right things, Africa can rise. And these things are happening in the political arena. When I look at Botswana, that little country which in 1966 was called Bechuanaland, which was given to Cesare Sehama as if it was nothing. The only thing that they were famous for was cattle rearing. They did not think much of Botswana. Then one year later, Botswana discovered diamond and the rest is history. They have demonstrated to the world that with your little resources, you can manage those resources effectively. They have demonstrated that you can have a democracy which is a democracy in name. They have had a culture which recognizes that leadership is not a wrestling match. Leadership is an opportunity to serve and elections are an opportunity in the democratic marketplace where the people give an opportunity to men and women to govern for a period. So between 1966, without the intervention of a coup d'etat, they have had Sasseret Sekama govern them, they have had Ketumile Masire govern them, they have had Festus Mohai govern them, they have had Ian Kama govern them, and is the only country on the continent of Africa ever to have had a budget surplus. It can be done. When I see Botswana, I know that it can be done. But it, it demonstrates that when you have the right politics and create the right environment, then you can see. And if you visit Botswana today, you are able to see, you don't need an explanation. You know, I've always said, when somebody says that they have done something and they have to spend one hour explaining what they have done, then they have done nothing. <laughs> when you have done something, you shut up. The things that you have done speak for themselves. And that is not the only country. The other country is Rwanda. In 1994, never in the history of the world post-1945 did the world witness 100, and 100 days of a pogrom where people rose against one another, killing each other. One million Rwandese of the Tutti extraction killed even in churches. Then the leadership of Paul Kagame came, a little country tucked inside the heart of Africa with no ocean to boast of, to export our goods, a landlocked country, with no natural resources, no tourist attraction except a few gorillas. What they have demonstrated by dint of proper and organized leadership 
is that when you introduce an environment, there is no shortage of detractors of Paul Kagame and some of the things that he does. But when you look at the history of Rwanda, perhaps there is justification for what he is doing for the moment. That country, you go to Kigali, perhaps the cleanest city in Africa, and you see that when you have men and women who love their country and are clear about where they want to go, then countries can realize their potential. When I see Rwanda, I know that Africa can rise. It is not my design to constipate you with information, but allow me to go to Mauritius. <laughs> Mauritius is a little island, only famous for sugarcane and tourism. A young country, a leader with a clear vision some of you will remember him. He looked at the country, recognized that we had no resource, and he said, my only resource is human resource. My only resource is sugar cane. So what do I do? I add value to my sugar cane, make my human resource good resource, and lo and behold, the second country in Africa ever to have had a budget surplus. It can be done. In other words, Africa has demonstrated that as long as you have hygiene in your politics, as long as your political radar points in the right direction, then you can achieve. So there are many other African countries which are reading from the wrong scripts. Those ones can be pulled away from the wrong script and be told the script you have is the wrong one. And they are... He served for 10 years and during the first 10 years, Zimbabwe did well. Yet history has demonstrated that when you are a good dancer, you must leave the stage. Scarcity adds value. That is what Robert Mugabe did not recognize. Today, Robert Mugabe has presided over a country, the only country in the world, which has no currency. <laughs> the Zimbabweans sometimes use the Pula of Botswana, Sometimes they use the yuan of, uh, of China. Sometimes they use the rand of South Africa. Sometimes they use the American dollar. And yet Robert Gabriel Mugabe refuses to go. I'm citing Robert Mugabe and Zimbabwe because if there was a course on how not to be a leader in a country, Robert Mugabe is a classical example of how not to lead and how to destroy Africa. But that will never be said to Robert Mugabe at a meeting of the African Union. They'll never tell him that. Because at that meeting, we are too nice to each other, and we have been too nice to each other in Africa for too long, with the consequence that we are now paying the price. So going forward, what must we do? Having recognized that leadership is our problem, we must define for ourselves who is a leader. Those of you who are present here, some of you may be in positions of leadership, some of you may be aspiring to positions of leadership in the political arena, but the question is why do you want to lead? In Africa, the shortest route to ill-gotten wealth is political leadership. If you want to get wealth without working for it at all, <laughs> join African politics. That is the truth everywhere in Africa except for very few places. The only place that stands out now in that regard is Tanzania with President John Pombe Magufuli. The rest in Africa 
I do not know, excuse me, I'm a visitor. <laughs> but when I was a student, I was told that they were, in our tradition we had this thing called hunters and gatherers. That instinct is still alive and well in our political leaders. They hunt and gather buildings and cars and money. And that is why African leadership does not attract her best men and women. And African electorate also responds to money. I do not know whether it happens here in Africa, in Ghana. The African electorate also expects to be bribed so that they can vote. And until the day we are able to exercise the ghost of ethnicity, among other things, and the ghost of corruption in Africa, Africa will never get good leaders. Let me, as I conclude, just remind you of two things. Not so long ago, news emerged that some papers had been exposed called the Panama Papers. And a number of African leaders and business people are named there. I have no problem with business people. It is their business to engage in business. There was also the case of the Prime Minister of Iceland. And he was mentioned and it was said that his wife had kept some money in Panama. The following day, over 20% of the Icelandic population were in the streets in the capital of Iceland in Reykjavik demanding that he leaves office. And the following day, he left. During that same week, in South Africa, the public protector made a finding that their president had used some money to improve his rural home, including the construction of a cattle kraal and a swimming pool which they said was for firefighting. <laughs> and the people of South Africa requested their president to leave, but he merely apologized. <laughs> you can see the different cultures. Recently, the second example is in the United Kingdom. They are young. Prime Minister, only age, fifth, age 50, called for a referendum as to whether the United Kingdom should leave Europe or not, and he lost the vote. And he took the decision that having lost the vote, there is no wisdom, political or otherwise, to continue to remain in office. And he resigned as the Prime Minister and a few months later resigned as the member of parliament. I now want you to imagine for a moment that the prime minister was the prime minister of Ghana. <laughs> First of all, he would have said that that vote was rigged. <laughs> and he would have said that, that his seat was never on the line. And that there is no reason why he should leave. And that there is every reason why he should dig in because it is him or her, particularly the hymns, who know what is in the best interest of Ghana. And Ghana is a metaphor. It could be Kenya, it could be Uganda, it could be Tanzania, it could be any African country. In other words, I'm saying that one of the things that we must do is to change our political culture. And political culture requires, among other things, that we must know that in the modern democratic dispensation, leadership is about governance and about servant leadership. Africa must recognize that if Africa is to survive. The African electorate must also be educated 
But one of the things that worries me, it appears that formal education, this education where we get degrees does not appear to help. We need another kind of education. We need a kind of education that changes our minds and hearts. A kind of education that revolutionizes our minds and hearts. It is only that other kind of education that is going to change us. And that kind of education is the kind of education that I think Kwame Nukuruma was talking about. If you listen to Kwame Nukuruma quite clearly, if you listen to him quite clearly, you Ghanaians and fellow Africans, and I have carefully read Kwame Nukuruma and his numerous speeches, it is amazing that as early as 1960s, he had the wisdom to see that science and technology was at the very heart of human development. And he founded the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. <laughs> Today I'm told that half of the graduates there graduate in humanities. <laughs> you lost the script. So that the university is in danger of becoming a university of science and technology simply because it is its name. You know, I remember at one of my discussions when we were at the university, a friend of mine who had failed to get his doctorate for a long time was in a quarrel with a professor and professor told him, you will never be a doctor unless you go and get another Christian name called doctor. So there, there is a danger that we have that. But I was talking about education. If you look at the idea of Kwame Nukuruma at that time, when he was talking about the University of Ghana at Legon, what kind of education was he talking about? When he was talking about the creation of the University of Cape Coast, what kind of education was he talking about? when he was talking about nuclear energy in 1960s. Kwame Nkrumah was talking about nuclear energy. In 1960s, Kwame Nkrumah was talking about the Akosombo Dam and the Tema Port and Takoradi. He was seeing all these things. Nineteen fifty seven to nineteen hundred and sixty six, only nine years. You imagine, because I believe Kwame Nkrumah would not have died in nineteen seventy two. Had he remained the president, he would not have died. And you imagine that he had presided over this country for fifteen years. You imagine, just imagine to yourself with the kind of ideas that he had. And if he was presiding, he was also because Nkrumah was contagious. He was afflicting other African leaders with different ideas. What was happening in Ghana would have happened in Guinea. What was happening in Guinea would have happened in Senegal. It would have happened across Africa and African politics would be totally different. These little 54 countries, which are not viable anyway, would simply have been states in a united Africa. Intra-African trade would be something else. We'll talk about that at a different stage. But what is important is that Kwame Nkrumah was clear, and I'm submitting to you, my fellow Africans, that until the day we have a political reawakening, Africa will never occupy her rightful place. Today, we have 54 African countries. Today. Today, we have 54 passports. Today, we have slightly under 45 currencies. Because CFA Frank has reduced the number. All these currencies are soft currencies. The term soft is never used. The only hard currencies that we have are the dollar, the pound sterling, the euro. The yen sometimes is soft, sometimes it is hard, but it's hardening anyway. 
the yuan is beginning to harden. Not a single African country has any currency that is worth talking about. You leave Ghana with your CD and Pesawa, you go to Senegal, is as good as pepper. <laughs> I came with my shilling here, it is useless, it can buy me nothing. I go to Angola and I have my Kwanzaa, it is useless. The trick lies in political reawakening so that we are able to see things differently. This is why China, you may quarrel about her politics, but China knows what she wants in her politics. That is why China is capable of assembling Africans, heads of states in Beijing, and they all rush there. <laughs> the 54 of them, all of them will go there. China does that. If today the President of the United States of America wanted to assemble African leaders, he only had to do this and they will all rush to Washington. Last month, the Chinese Prime Minister assembled 35 African heads of states in Nairobi, Kenya, and they all went there. Because we are political lightweights, we have no presence in the Security Council of the United Nations. We have no presence. When there is a meeting of the G8, occasionally they invite one or two African leaders just as a way of humoring them. And they are kept mostly in some waiting room. When the real issues are being discussed, they'll never be there. Then they are invited when there is a fourth opportunity. And if you look very keenly, they'll stand at the back. The real leaders stand in front. When there is the G20, the same thing is done. In other words, until the day that we are able to demonstrate that we have become politically of age, Nobody is going to respect us. And that is why this afternoon, this evening, I've started my series of lectures where I think I ought to have started by talking about what Kwame said, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest shall be given unto you. Kwame was so clear in saying so. Kwame was so clear in saying that we should neither look east nor west, we should look forward. And he was clear that until the day that we are united, we are not going to achieve anything. And speaking in 1964 in Cairo, he said, Africa is such a geographically unified continent. If only she could find political unity and political clarity, this continent will be a great continent. Her people will be a people that are respected her people will be a people that will realize their potential. Her politics will be the politics that will help Africa and help Africans and make Africa to be a continent and a people that are respected in the world. Kwame Nukuruma was right. Kwame Nukuruma is right. Kwame Nukuruma will always be right. But do we have the spirit of Kwame Nukuruma? This is what we must imbue ourselves with. We must honor Kwame Nukuruma by doing the things that he talked about because he must have been born 50 years ahead of his time. But now, 50 years later, we should be able to see what Kwame stood for. Let us wake up that we may realize our potential. Thank you and may God bless you.